So thanks guys for having me here. I love to talk about mental health and to me, mental health is brain health. I am a neurotherapist and a psychotherapist and I got into brain health when one of my sons was hit by a car and in fifth grade he came to me and he said, mom, my brain just doesn't work anymore. Well, I had been in ICU twice with brain injuries, so I got it, I understood it. And I started, that really is what opened the door for what mental health and brain health is all about. So I wanna just, everybody just stop, take a deep breath, flip back. Let's go back to March 2020, when 316 million Americans were quarantined. And they were quarantined to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus. So, you know, at that time, I'll never forget, I'm from Texas and Governor Abbott, he came on the radio and he said, if you're a non-essential business, you have to close your doors. And I was like, ah, oh, thank you. Because I had struggled with that. My family had talked to me and my family had said, mom, are you gonna keep your business open? Because with doing therapy, you're right on people's head. You're putting cats on their head and it's, it's a very intimate relationship. And so when the governor said, you know, you really need to close, I was so relieved. But the first thought that I had was, who's gonna take care of all the people? Somebody's gotta do it. So it's those frontline workers, it's those people in the hospital, it's the techs, it's the nurses, it's the doctors. It's, you know, it's a lot of people. And that's what really hit me because COVID-19 really did change mental health. And it almost set an, un it, we've never seen anything like this before. I mean, when you think we've been through, you know, wars, World War I, World War II, we've never been through anything like this before. And every day, those frontline workers had to show up. They had to be there. Do you think, you know, I think about how relieved that I personally was that I didn't have to do it. But every day they did. And they did it in a situation that was so stressful and all they, every day you got up and you heard about the increased exposure, how much worse it is, and they did it. They showed up and they did amazing things. And I think that what we have to really stop and think about is how, what, it's not just the impact of that. The psychological quarantine, I mean, I've already looked at studies of people that have worked in the hospitals that they, you know, they work in the, with the patients, then they have to be quarantined for nine days. And the, all those studies show the same thing. Those frontline workers, they come out with anxiety, depression, burnout, panic attacks, disassociation, fatigue. They all show the same thing. And so I think that psychological impact of quarantine is something we're gonna see the results of for quite a while. And then you think about, you know, the loss of a lot of people lost their jobs, a lot of people had financial loss, social isolation, and the biggest thing was loss of community. I couldn't go to the gym anymore. I couldn't go to church, you know? Kids couldn't go to school. So that whole loss of community really played into it. And you gotta remember, before the pandemic, one out of four Americans suffered from either a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue. So think what, what this is gonna add to that. And when you look at the suicide rates, the suicide rates have increased every year since 2012. And that's just America, that's globally. So, you know, the pandemic has changed our mental health, no doubt about it. The, what I've seen in my clinic is the way that it's impacted people, that psychological stress. You know, I have people that come, that during the pandemic have come in and they said, you know, Lee, I'm convinced there's something, there's something wrong with me physically. You know, I've got, I haven't had eczema in years and I'm just covered in it. Or my asthma hasn't bothered me in years and now I can't breathe. And of course, and, and the examples go on and on. And my first thing is, well, have you talked to a, a medical doctor about that? Oh yeah, well, what did they find? They couldn't find anything. There's nothing wrong. And so that, okay, well, something's causing it. And that's when, you know, I started to make the link for them. Your physical health is linked to your emotional health. I always say the body keeps score of what's going on in the brain. And 
you know, I've had this conversation many times, and in the beginning, people were more, I'm like, journal about it. You, you really need to capture it and journal about it. Okay, okay. But with the stress that the pandemic brought, I would say, have you journaled? Oh, no, you know. I, I just don't know how to do that. I just don't know how to even think about doing that. So it's not that complicated. Um, and I realized for, that I have to give them the tools. And for those of you that work in the healthcare, if you manage healthcare teams, you've got to understand they are so burnt out that they cannot take the initiative. There's a great website, and, and I have no association with this website at all. It's mentalhealthofamerica.org. So I thought, how can I get these people to do it? So I went there and I printed out a form. It's just a simple form. But what it does is it has you list the physical symptoms that you're feeling next to the emotional symptoms that you're feeling. And when people look at that side by side, they can start to identify what those patterns are. Oh, you know what? I always get terrible stomach pains when I get in a fight with my partner. So what can I change? Well, quit fighting. Take the dog for a walk, you know? But we make it sound so simple. And it really, it, the, I have found the more that I can give people, they'll do it. If I tell them they're so burnt out, to go figure it out and do it on their own, it's probably not gonna happen. So what I compare, compare COVID-19 to is a war zone. I really feel like that the people that have been, they're, they're our frontline workers. They've been in that hospital every day. You know, when you think about during the pandemic, family members couldn't even come in the room. Who was the one person that they had contact? Who was the one person that was there for them? And I had clients during this time that were nurses and doctors and techs, and the stories that they told me, I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to witness someone, you're there for them every day and you come in for, for your next shift and they're gone. And they weren't checked out, they were deceased. So the, just the pressure and, and what they've been through. And what I found listening to people is they all want the best. They said they know what they needed to do. They, know, they knew quality care. They knew what they needed to do to give the best level of care. They set their expectations there, but guess what? We, we, weren't, we weren't prepared for this. Systemically, we didn't have the resources to support this. So they couldn't do it, they couldn't give their best care. They're, and they were oftentimes frustrated and beat down and negative about themselves because they feel like that they're not able to do what they, supposed to, what they need to do. I mean, I think that is one thing that really, working with these people, the one thing I ask myself at the end of the day every day is, what's what's missing why you know they need something and it wasn't hard to figure out what they needed they needed they needed support and in order to figure that out we did a survey and this survey was done between june 2020 and september 2020 and i was amazed i was absolutely amazed at the numbers and you can see them I mean, I don't have to read you, quote you the percentages, but they're all high. You know, they're experiencing anxiety, they're experiencing depression, they're experiencing burnout. And, you know, this is just what they're experiencing on a personal level. And it made me stop and wonder, what do they do with their families? How do they, how do they deal with that? Because, and what surprised me about this survey is 71% of the people that they interviewed were between the ages of 18 and 44. Those are young adults. 21% of those were, were between 18 and 24. Stop and think about it. Could you have dealt with that situation when you were 20 years old? I can guarantee you, I couldn't. So it's, it's been, just on all levels, it's been taken to a whole different level. And the thing that I heard from my clients over and over and over is they're just so worried about their family. You know, I'm exposed to, I'm exposed to it all day long. What if, I, what if I infect a member of my family? What if one of my kids gets sick after being exposed to me? Or what if my parents you know, get sick after being exposed to me? And they cared so much 
sometimes I think we care more about our family than we do about ourselves. I know I have at times. And I think that's something that's just really hard for them to deal with. And, you know, what was missing? I'm always asking the question, what's missing? Because I want to fix it. And I finally realized I can't fix it. But what I can do is share information and share coping strategies and create an awareness. But what was really missing was emotional well-being. You know, these people were emotionally exhausted. And stop and think about it. Think of every day they're interacting, they're supporting dying patients. Think about the emotional weight that that carries on your shoulders. That's that's pretty incredible, the impact of that. And, you know, when we looked at the numbers, and again, I don't have to read you the numbers off the slide. Does anybody see anything on that slide that surprises them, that they think is, is overstated or understated? I saw one, and the, the number where I honestly think 100% of the people in that situation were experiencing anxiety. So I've decided that 7% of them were probably lying. But and it, because I think they all had to be. And I think that, you know, when you get to the point where you dread going to work, you wake up. I know we, when you're in the healthcare world, you wake up and you want to, oh, today I'm going to do my best. I'm motivated. I want to create good change. And I can't imagine waking up and going, Oh, today I'm going to work. I hope I get through the day. I hope nobody dies. I hope I don't have to be the one to go out and talk to the family. I, I, that, that is a load that when, and I'm going back to that population, 18 to 24, 20% 20 of these people are 18 to 24 years old. I couldn't have handled it. And I think, you know, when you, I think 52% of them felt compassion fatigue. You give, you give, you give, and then you just, quite honestly, you don't have anything to give anymore. And we all reach that point. I think that, you know, when you think about emotional support, you think about your family, you think about your community. And during COVID, during the pandemic, our, we were so afraid of losing our family. Our communities had been shut down that where could we go for support? And those people that were on the front line, they certainly needed support more than, than any others. And it's interesting because one of the things that, that hit me, I have a lady that works with me, and she's my, she is my, she's my soulmate, but she, her husband is an ER doctor, and she has autoimmune deficiencies. And I saw the struggle that this pushed, that this placed on their family during COVID. He wanted to go to work. He wanted to do his job. That's what he did. But he was so afraid that he would come home and expose her to something. And I watched him struggle. And luckily, he was a pretty handy doctor. So he took the garage and he made it into his man cave. And he lived in that man cave for six months. Wasn't the best, wasn't the best answer, certainly. He wasn't that happy, but it provided him the ability to do his job and to know in his heart that he wasn't exposing his wife to anything else. What we all need and what they needed was emotional support. And the study looked at this, this emotional support aspect and found that 39% of the healthcare workers felt that they did not have the emotional support that they needed. Nurses were even more, they were 45% of the nurses said that they did not have the support that they needed. And what was really surprised me is the one that felt they were getting emotional support. You know where they were getting it from? Their coworkers, you know? And it was their coworkers that they turned to and they felt like that they got what they needed. But I know the nurses that I worked with, they were parenting. They, they love being a mom or a dad. I had both, both genders. They loved that, but parenting became so hard. And it wasn't just parenting. I mean, what do you think about homeschooling? And maybe your parents move in with you, and then you're homeschooling. That gets to be a really stressful situation. And, it, you know, it wasn't just parenting that they felt like they couldn't do. 63% of them 
felt like they could just, they, they couldn't do life, man. They'd come home from work and they're so tired. They can't cook dinner. They can't keep up with the chores. And that's a pretty exhausting feeling. So whoop, I think that we've established how, what the stress level was. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about coping strategies, because whether you lead a healthcare team, whether you're a frontline worker, or whether you're living in the middle of it like all of us, there are some coping strategies that we really need to stop and think about. Because you're not in it by yourself. And if we're all in it together and we keep that perspective, we'll feel more inclined to deal with it. One of the things that I talk with my clients about on a regular basis is let's just get real simple. We don't have to get real fancy. Let's get real simple. Are you eating healthy? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you taking breaks during the day? How many of you at any point in time will stop and take a short break during the day. I'm so glad to see some hands. So it was real interesting to me because Microsoft did some, some really interesting studies. When we were in the middle of COVID and everybody's on Zoom meetings, they realized that the digital intensity of the world had just gone up a notch. And they noticed within their workforce that meeting fatigue was just, it was killing people. So they stopped and they asked themselves, what can I do about that? I think I'll just pick one up. What can I do about that? Hello, hello. Well, can't do anything. There we go. And so they formed uh, a team, and they did exactly what I do when they want to know what's going on with somebody. They put a cap on their head, and they recorded data. So they set, the, they set the experiment up. There were 14 people, and it was conducted over two weeks. The first week, the 14 people with the cap on their head, they got up, they came in, and back to back, they had four 30-minute meetings. And the 30-minute meetings were just normal meetings. They were about different subjects with different people, and they recorded all that data. The second week, those 14 people come back, and they'd say, OK, today we're going to do the same thing. We're going to record the brain waves, but between each 30-minute meeting, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and we're going to do a little meditation. And they all use the medication app Calm, and it's a great. There's lots of great apps. They just wanted the continuous variable for their study, so we're all going to use the the meditation app Calm. And what they found was amazing. And you know, I wish I could show you the brain waves. I'm, I'm the nerdy brain lady. But they could actually look at the brain waves and see beta, high beta is a real fast wave, and it makes you anxious, and it makes you irritable. And they could see that when people came back to those meetings after that break, their beta had calmed down. You know, and they came up with some good takeaways. And the first part takeaway was the brain needs a break. It needs a break to reset and rejuvenate. Because that stress that you're going through, and think about, it. we're talking about guys in business meetings. Think about these healthcare workers. They're not in a meeting, they're going from room to room to room. And you know, that stress just continues to pile on, that cumulative stress. And they found that by taking just taking that little 10-minute break, that they could let go of that stress. And it's hard transitioning from one meeting to another. And they found with that little 10-minute break that people were more engaged. They could focus better. So I think it's, it's amazing to me what just taking a 10-minute break throughout your day can do. And the good news is is they incorporated these studies into their software package. So all of you have the ability to set your schedule in Outlook and schedule in that 10-minute break. And that's something that I hope you all will do. Because it, that creates, I've started doing it, and it makes such a difference. I don't even feel guilty about it anymore. I did for a while. So another coping strategy that, that we can look at is how we support each other. And you know, I, I know I, I work in the healthcare world, and I know that those people, they don't feel like they worry about their friends and their family all day long. But they don't know what to do about that. For those of you that supervise healthcare teams, reach out to them. Tell them, hey, 
take five minutes. Go check in on your coworker. You know, text your wife, see how she's doing. Have you heard from your kid? You know, make that connection so that you feel you can rest at ease and know that your family is well taken care of. And it's, it's so hard to do, but given the permission, people will do it. That's one thing that, that I encourage my clients is, you know what, it's okay to not be okay. And that's, I, I wrote a book, Turn Your Brain On to Get Your Game On. And the whole reason for that book was so people would understand it's okay to not be okay. So when you look at coping strategies and helping people to check in with themselves, you know, I used to talk about self-care. And self-care is taking care of your body, eating right, getting enough sleep, exercising. But now, after the pandemic, I've kind of cranked that up. It's really not self-care, it's soul care. And soul care, care is taking care of your mental and your emotional state. And you've got to learn to self-soothe. When you find yourself in that agitated state, you're so overwhelmed or you're just so tired and burn out, you've got to learn to self-soothe. And it's not that hard. I mean, if you can focus on your breathing, and if you can learn to take real slow, deep breaths, that will change everything. Right now, when I'm talking to you, I gotta take 12 to 14 breaths a minute. When I'm taking in my optimal breath zone, I'm taking between four and seven. Slow your breath rate down, slow your heart rate down, get those two to dance together, create heart rate variability. It's a sign of wellness. You know, use visualization. Close your eyes. Go to your happy place. Get creative. For the first time in my life, I actually painted during the pandemic because it made me feel good. And for some of us, you know, it's exercise. Whatever you can do to help you calm yourself down and create peace. Because it really does come down to we're in charge. And we have to take responsibility for our own mental health. Another coping strategy, and I'm going to go through this pretty quick, is, you know, during the pandemic, we all wanted to stay informed. I had clients that had the news on 24-7. But, or they were on social media 24 seven. So it's important to stay informed, but where are you getting your information? Harvard Health, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, there's great places. Some blog, some Facebook group, just pay attention to where you get your information and how long you, you spend looking at that information. Focus on what you can control, and I say this probably 20 times a day, is it really is important to focus on what you can control. Because Harvard Health says 80% of us were either lost in the past or were worried about the future. We can't stay present, we can't stay in the moment. And if you're not staying in the moment, then you're probably not sleeping very well. You probably have some focus issues. You probably don't necessarily want to be around other people. So when at the end of the day, if you can stay present and you can focus on what's important to you, and just, you know, to really, to stay, what I have found, to stay focused, I have to stay grounded. I have to stay grounded mentally, but to stay grounded mentally, I have to be grounded physically. And physic when I need to ground myself physically, I just stop. Okay, instead of becoming overwhelmed, what do I see? Okay, well, I see people out there and they're looking at me, so that's a good thing, you know. Well, what do I hear? Well, I don't hear anything, so they're not talking. That's a good thing. Well, what do I feel? What do I smell? What do I taste? You know, the power of observation is one of the greatest skills that you have. Use it because it will help you to stay grounded. And again, I've talked... How do people get grounded? I, try, I talk it all day long. I go on the mentalhealthofamerica.org. I print out a little one-page paper and give it to them, and they start doing it. Kind of makes me mad that <laughs> the one-page paper works better than me. But I just, I'm just happy it does. Another thing that I encourage everyone to do is to keep educating yourself. You know, not, it's different than being informed. 
work, try to learn new things. What can you do to change a process where you work? What can you learn to make it easier for the people that you work with to do your job? And when you're learning, cool stuff is happening in the brain, man. That brain is reorganizing and organizing, actually will change the physical structure. So keep learning, because that's when the brain really, great things are happening. And you know the most important thing I think that I that I've experienced personally and professionally is during the pandemic we lost connection. We were social social distancing, social isolation. So you know, reach out. You've got to become your own advocate, and you've got to reach out. And you've, whether it's with a text or a call or whatever it is, you've got to reach out and you've got to exchange. Let people know, hey, I'm here to support you. And if you need support, you let me know. And you may have to create that platform for connection. If it's not there, create your own. But if you think that it's just going to happen because you want it to, I hate to tell you this, it ain't going to happen. I think that the most important thing that you can do is take responsibility for your mental health. And you almost you have to become your own best advocate. The best thing that happened to me during the pandemic was every day I learned how to check in. Hey, Lee, how are you doing today? What do you need? Do you feel lonely? Reach out to somebody. Do you need exercise? Reach out to somebody. So you've, you've got to check in with yourself, be your own advocate, and communicate it. If you think people can read your mind on what your needs are, Trust me, they can't. And you know what? Treat yourself with kindness. And that's one of the things that I think we lost during COVID was that empathy, that feeling and understanding of other people. And so many of my clients, they have, you know, they're grieving. I want my normal back. I want my normal back too. But the problem is, is I can't even tell you what that is anymore. And I can't visualize what the new normal is. And my advice is, you got to give yourself time to heal. I think everybody in here has something to heal from. And forgiveness is the best way to do it. And all forgiveness is, is letting go. Whoever, whatever hurt you, you resent, made you angry, let it go. Because if you want to stay connected to your own mental health, you've got to let go of all the negative. And when in doubt, Seek professional health. You know, it doesn't have to be a therapist. It can be a pastor. It can be a manager, a supervisor. And there's, after COVID, there's some local resources. And again, mentalhealthamerica.org, you can go to that website and you can do a mental health screen. And it's just a way to open the door if you have somebody you're concerned about. Hey, let's take a snapshot. Let's see how you're feeling. Now, is that the same thing as a diagnosis? No, but it does offer some help. And I encourage people, you know, I love talking mental health. I love talking brain health. If you have any questions, if we have time now, I'm happy to answer them. And if not now, please call the office and Bismarck will answer and just tell him that we were at the conference and you'd like to schedule a 30-minute call. No charge, just to talk about things or shoot me an email. I don't know. I thank you so much for listening to me. I love, love being here and appreciate your time. So I don't know if we have time for questions, but I don't see any hands, so I guess we're all good. Thanks again.